dear students you are welcome now we are going to discuss practices of organic farming or cultural practices in organic farming or simply management of crops in organic systems so it, it, it will be including your rotations nutrient management and management of insect pest and diseases as you are already aware about the four components or four pillars of organic farming so three we have discussed and technology packages left so you can see one and three organic standards and certification are supported by national program on organic production npop for third party certification and pgs it is national center of organic and natural farming gaziabad the fourth one is controlled by farmer consumer and lot of middlemen are there in the marketing network and so far technology packages are concerned it is mostly implemented by farmer and they get knowledge from research institutions kvks state agricultural universities technology package so in technology package what kind of technologies are required or what kind of guidelines are required for choice of crops and variety uh, now uh, choice of crops is concerned is concerned concerned then number of things are required because when you select a crop you need to look for first soil can can i grow this soil, uh, this particular crop in a soil if i am having sandy soil uh, largely sandy soils then i will not take rice in that crop i will prefer some other crop which required light light texture soils similarly if i get water log soils where i expect lot of water then i cannot plant soybean in that i have to go for rice so similarly uh, uh, not just soil climatic conditions and also the 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 marketing conditions also de determine the kind of crop you are going to have uh, going to have this crop similarly uh, what can be done in choice of crops preference should be given to leguminous crops pulses oil seeds and low volume crops low volume crops like your spices condiments um legumes oil seeds and lastly at last you can go for uh cereal crops and uh other crops but if you see at what level the area under cereal crops crops is highest but anyway wherever uh, choice is there then one should go for low volume crops or high value crops and then varieties in variety one one should see whether the a particular variety is resistant or tolerant to insect pest and diseases can this variety compete better better with the weeds so these kind of things should be taken in mind and another, another point is that whether the variety varieties nutrient requirement is low we should take varieties which require less nutrients therefore i suggested that we can start with pulses and your oil seeds which require less nutrients number 2 is Yeah, just a minute. Where this presentation has gone? Resume share. Okay. Ah, uh, now next is your crop rotations, mixed intercropping, green manuring, and legumes. So, what kind of crop rotations should be there? What is ideal crop rotation for my condition? what kind of intercropping will be suitable for my condition and green manuring or like sometimes these rotations and uh, not sometimes the indian institute of farming system research have identified crops and crop rotations for different regions of the country i will show you then sowing time sowing time for organic crop is almost same uh, for a particular crop as you have for conventional farm there is no separate research for sowing time so for the time being we need to follow the conventional farming sowing time tillage operations here in organic farming you need to prepare your field the way you prepare in the conventional farm there is no very specific recommendation for 
tillage operations. However, now some farmers are thinking to start hybrid, uh, hybrid of organic farming and conservation agriculture. So you can call it organic conservation agriculture or conservation organic agriculture. You can call it either way, but some people are talking about it. Where certain practices of conservation agriculture like crop rotation, munching, and no tillage can be applied to the organic farm. So that kind of research is also being done. Then comes your nutrient management. Nutrient management is different here compared to conventional farming. And we will discuss the nutrient management. Similarly, weed, insect pests, and disease management, many practices are common, but except one practice. That is, chemical weed control is not adopted in organic farming. However, other methods like soil solidization or cultural practices, physical methods, biological control measures uh, can be preferably used in organic farming. Now, crop rotations and selection of crop is very, very important. And uh, these rotations I already discussed are important for improving physical, chemical, and biological properties of the soil. And this diversification of crop, uh, diversification practices reduce organic to conventional yield gap. If you want to get the similar yield under organic farming, then you need to go for uh, crop diversification or adoption of crop rotations. Then yield can be narrowed down by nine to 10%. You can uh, bridge the gap between yields of conventional farming and organic farming. Now you can see the benefits of crop rotations and their concerns or limitations. So benefits of crop rotations like improved soil organic matter, improved nutrient cycling, mitigation of greenhouse gases, and reduced insect pest problems. And there are certain limitations of crop rotations, more laborious because you need to deal with many crops challenges in adoption. You need to know the techniques of growing many crops and fitting them uh, and doing sowing, plowing very frequently. If you take just two crops in a year, one crop in a year, then it is much easier. If you follow, take two crops, three crops or four crops, then it becomes a challenge. Increased uncertainty and high initial cost. So there are some concerns, some uh, limitations of crop rotations there. Now you can see the, the crops, state-wise major crops grown under organic farming in India, both certified and in conversion. You see the preference of farmers or, or people, uh, Arunachal Pradesh maize, sorghum pulses, Andhra cotton maize, Assam tea coffee. You can go through the list. Uh, I, uh, I will send you this presentation. Uh, have you received the presentation sent by me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So at least you could have written, thank you, sir. Uh, you have to be a bit polite. When you, thank you so much, sir. No, not now. But whenever you receive some email from your friends, you always say thank you, you know. So for your teacher also, you can give a small thank you. Uh, uh, when when I, I sent you this uh, PPT and some other information, so you just should have done it so that I could know that you have received. Anyway, this is your personal uh, thinking. Now you can see Rajasthan, cotton, wheat, seed spices. In Tamil Nadu, tea, herbs, spices, and in different states you can see. Now there is a book or booklet you can say proceeding from ICR, Network Project on Organic Farming. And they are giving you crop rotations and selection of crops. And you read the title, Scientific Package of Practices for Organic Production of Crops in Cropping Systems. So this is the publication, which is giving a lot of information about production technology of organic crops. So here you can see things like this rotation. So suppose they have given, uh, for Chhattisgarh, they have found soybean chickpea rotation as the best. Uh, soybean, onion, and rice chickpea. So they found these three rotations suitable for Chhattisgarh. So that means they have also given the package of practices for these cropping systems. 
So what to do in soybean chickpea system or soybean onion system in Chhattisgarh? Complete package is given in detail. Anybody interested can see this document or I can share this document. For Himachal Pradesh, maize, garlic, cauliflower, pea, tomato, coriander, pea, tomato. So you can see here, uh, only one cereal crop is there in Himachal Pradesh. Maize has been recommended. Otherwise, see mostly vegetables. Similarly, but in Jharkhand, you see rice, wheat, rice, land. Rice is always there in Jharkhand. Because of soil condition, climatic conditions, they may be getting a lot of water in rainy season. So there may not be other choice except rice. So then in Kerala, you see it is a state of uh, masala, a state of spices, turmeric, ginger, black pepper, elephant food, yam, green menu. So these are the crops and their rotations or mixed cropping, intercropping, you can see. Green manuring cowpea, then yam plus green manuring cowpea. So please go through all these cropping system. For Punjab, maize, potato, summer, mung bean, turmeric, onion, and so on. For Uttarakhand, you can see basmati rice, wheat, sasvenia. So here, they are not suggesting normal rice. They are suggesting basmati rice. Because the nutrient requirement of basmati rice is low, then the high yielding variety and the high bids. And the premium price is also high for basmati rice. So therefore, basmati rice is suggested for Uttarakhand. Now you see the package of practices. As I was telling you, that there are different rotations and package of practices also given. For example, for Chhattisgarh, these are the three rotations. And I have just shown you the small piece of the page. And then you can go into the details of the uh, management of these uh, three cropping systems. It is just a repeat of the things. Now, after selection of crops and cropping system, we should go for nutrient management, nutrient management under organic system. So one thing is that if you are going to start organic farming, sufficient biodegradable material has to be there. Microbial origin, plant or animal origin to be produced on farm. Means you must ensure that you can produce organic manures on the farm. You should also be able to prevent the nutrient losses. So these are very general guidelines of nutrient management under NPOP for organic systems. Prevent nutrient losses, prevent entry of pollutants, heavy metal, etc. So you need to know the sources of pollutants and stop them. Non-synthetic mineral fertilizer and biofertilizer to supplement nutrients. So mineral fertilizer can be used, but they need to be non-synthetic. They need to be natural fertilizer like gypsum. Gypsum is considered as natural fertilizer, natural mineral fertilizer, because it is not synthesized. It is just some physical processing is done and you can use the gypsum. And similarly, rock phosphate can be used in organic farming. So non-synthetic mineral fertilizer, even muriate of potash that is extracted from mines can be used in raw forms. And of course, biofertilizer. These are very general guidelines for nutrient management. And then desired soil pH should be maintained. Just by maintaining the proper pH, you can increase the availability of many nutrients. If your soil is too much alkaline, then you will not, your soil cannot supply you the iron, it cannot supply manganese, it cannot supply molybdenum, etc. So uh, the pH can be brought down simply by adding lime. You can add lime, you can add sulfur. They, these are allowed in organic farm. So sulfur or lime can be added to decrease the pH and make it suitable so that you need not to add additional nutrient. But if you correct the soil pH, availability of the nutrients can be increased. Limitations are set for the total amount of biodegradable material brought onto the farm unit. So what happens, you can produce the organic manures of the farm's requirement, but sometimes you are not able to uh, produce the whole requirement. Suppose you need 20 tons of farmyard manure, 
at your organic farm, but you have produced 15 tons of farmyard manure at your farm. So remaining five uh, tons of FIM, you can buy from the market. You can bring from other farm. So limitations are set for the total amount of biodegradable material brought onto the farm unit. That means certification agency can allow certain proportion of farmyard manure from outside. So such kind of uh, ceilings are fixed price certification is. Manures containing human excreta are never allowed. Human excreta is never allowed in organic farm for the reason that it may have heavy metals and uh, if it is not digested properly, if it is not decomposed properly, then it can spread some bacteria, some bacteria which can be harmful to human beings like Salmonella, E. coli, etc. can spread from this excreta. Therefore, human excreta is not permitted in organic farm. Mineral fertilizer shall be applied in their natural composition. If you are applying mineral fertilizer, means natural fertilizer, not synthetic like gypsum, sulfur mineral, and your KCL in raw form can be applied. So like basics like rock phosphate should not have any high heavy metal content. If you are using rock phosphate or basic slag, there should not be high levels of cadmium or other heavy metals. Now, you need to see very critically products for use in fertilizing or soil condition. What can be used to supply nutrients at organic farm? Number one, preference should go to the, to produce the matter right on the farm means matter produced on an organic farm unit. So organic farm can produce certain uh, farmyard manure, it can produce some compost, it can produce vermicompost, green manuring can be practiced, crop residues can be added to the soil. So what proportion of uh, total organic matter requirement is produced on the organic farming unit. So that can be easily applied. Whatever is produced on the organic farm as a nutrient source, that can be applied directly into the soil without any consideration if it is produced on an organic farm. But if the whole requirement is not met out in number one, then number two says that metal produced outside the organic farm unit can also be used, but with some restriction and sealing that you can use, say, 20% from outside, 80% you have to produce on the farm. So matter produced outside the organic farm unit can also be used, but with the permission of the certification agency. If certification agency is satisfied, okay, there is not too much of chemical in this product, the farmer can buy it, then okay, it will allow the farmer to buy this item. These kind of items are known as restricted item, restricted use, then minerals, so certain minerals, as I told you, gypsum, uh, lime, or uh, basic slag, rock phosphate can be used in organic farming. Microbiological preparation can be used. Uh, there is no any bar on these preparation, rhizobium, uh, mycorrhiza, any kind of uh, biological organism can be used. So in these cases, you will find that certain nutrient sources are permitted certain nutrient sources are prohibited and certain nutrient sources are restricted and certain are allowed. So there may be different categories of the product as per, as per the organic standards. <clears throat> so permitted means allowed without any restriction. So in this case, matter produced on an organic farm are permitted. Prohibited means not allowed in any case. As I told you the case of human excreta, it is prohibited. It will never be allowed. Then you see restricted products. So they are allowed under certain defined conditions. These conditions are to be defined by the certification agency. Factors such as contamination, risk of nutritional imbalances, and depletion of natural resources shall be taken into consideration by the certification agency. Besides this restricted, there may be one more thing 
which is known as factory farm. So under okay. organic system, you cannot go the, the way factories are going. Factory farming is, is not permitted under organic farming. Do you know meaning of factory farming? Anybody knows meaning of factory farming? What is factory farming? Anybody, Sumit? Don't know, sir. Sai? Don't know, sir. Don't know, sir. Don't know, sir. No, sir. Okay. So, uh, have you visited any factory? Factory of cycle, factory of motorcycle, car manufacturer, or factory that produces shoes. A lot of industrial products are made by factories. So, if you go there, if you go there, the first thing is that in factory farming, they are interested for profit. They are not concerned about moral morality or many things, many issues, they, they forget ethics and so on. They want their cost of production should be lower and then they should get best price so that their profit is low. Have you ever visited poultry farm? Poultry farm, which is modern poultry farm. In modern poultry farm, you see everything is automated. Everything is automated. You go to birds, and there are different layers of the housing. If you go into the shed where poultry live, there are different strata of their, their bedding, you know, bedding. If you go, they are layered bed bedding, one layer, two layer, third layer, and then you get some spaces in between. And then feeding arrangement is there. The egg laying hens will lay the egg. This egg will be automatically collected in one place. The feed will be distributed automatically. They will get the water automatically. No human involvement, very little human involvement. Everything is automated in poultry, modern poultry system. If you get a chance, you go there. So this, this is a biological organism. Poultry is a biological organism and you are using it as, as, as a physical means. It cannot be used as a physical means. The poultry is living in very small space, very small cage. It cannot walk. It, can, it is being used uh, as, as, as a means, uh, as a non-living. It is being used as a non-living. So factory farming means you are growing animals uh, by force, artificial way. That is your factory farm. Now I, I came to know that meat is being grown in factories. Now biotechnological tools, uh, you can grow meat in laboratories without getting actually animals there. You don't want uh, babies of the animal. Babies of the pig are not required. You take a piece of their DNA, a piece of their, their meat, and then you can grow it into volumes of meat. Uh, did you know that? So these are all factory farms where there is too much of artificial production. So you can see meaning of factory farming. Today you can Google it to know more about factory farming. So refers to industrial management systems that are heavily reliant on veterinary and feed inputs on permitted, not permitted in organic agriculture. So it means factory farming here means less time. In less time you want more. So here uh, in veterinary, like your poultry example I gave, you can put some antibiotics and you can also use some hormones for their faster growth. And then they will start laying the eggs quickly. So this is not factory, this is farming. It takes time, it takes time. So that is your factory farming. Hope it is clear to you. <clears throat> now matter produced on an organic farm unit permitted, like farmyard, poultry manure, Produced right on the organic farming can be used. Slurry, gobar gas slurry can be used. Cow urine can be used. Crop residues, green manure, and straw and other money. Whatever organic sources of nutrients are there on an organic farm can be directly used without any restriction. Now, if you want to buy it or bring it from outside, matter produced outside the organic farm unit, and you want to use it, let us see what are the materials. So permitted are saw, sawdust, wood shavings. They can be used, whether they are from conventional farming or wherever they are, they are allowed. 
prohibited items are human excrement and restricted items means certain proportion of nutrient can be supplied by these sources not the whole nutrient supply so like blood meal meat meal bone meal feather meal without preservatives compost made from any carbon based residues animal excreta including pot so they are allowed means restricted use certain proportion of nutrient can be supplied in organic farm or organic farming through these sources more restricted product like fym you can bring from outside the farm slurry cow urine factory factory farming sources are not permitted means if you are having poultry in automated poultry in automated machines you cannot use its excreta here fish and fish products without preservative can be used many times fish manure is also there that can be used guano can be used guano is excreta of birds by products from food and textile industries can be used use here means restricted use seaweed and seaweed products are obtained by physical process seaweed sludge sludge and urban compost is, is straw seaweed sludge can be used only after the treatment not before the treatment now vermi cast can be used uh, vermi cast are the cast means excreta of the worms your earthworm on the right side in the picture you can see these are the cast vermi cast in, in the feed in the field uh, by the earthworms you may notice sometimes in the soil animal charcoal compost spent mushroom compost from organic household compost from plant residues by product from oil palm palm oil mill effluent cocoa peat and empty cocoa pods so these are the items which find restricted use then some minerals that are permitted you can see which are allowed calcified seaweed calcium chloride calcium carbonate sodium chloride magnesium sulfate gypsum clay bentonite pyrite zeolite they are allowed restricted minerals like basics basic slag calcareous and magnesium rock mineral potassium sulfate of potash kainite natural phosphate rock phosphate trace elements certain minerals contain some trace elements boron iron manganese molybdenum zinc they can be directly used wood ash from untreated wood potassium sulfate and sulfur so minerals can be used in their natural forms they are not synthetic fertilizers when microbiological preparation are permitted like bacterial preparation bio fertilizers are allowed certain biodynamic preparations are also there they are allowed plant preparation and botanical extract and peat now you have seen that lot of uh, products or options are available for organic farming but at one particular location you cannot find all sources you will find the sources will vary with the local conditions or climatic conditions or farming conditions so option to supply nutrients through organic sources multiple sources needed no one source is enough as it depends upon availability and market prices all organic inputs do not uniformly supply the need therefore you need combination of nutrients some can release nutrient faster some can release nutrients slower like if you have green manure it can release nutrients faster if you have paddy straw or wheat straw it will release nutrients slowly if you have composted manure it will release nutrients slowly if you have vermi compost it will release nutrient fast so comparative assessment can be made and mixture of things can be used the aim is to optimize the use of on farm resources and minimize the losses and you can see what are the inputs possible you can combine organic manures crop residues natural fertilizers here means mineral fertilizers which are obtained naturally biological nitrogen fixation irrigation water in some cases the irrigation water is rich in nutrients uh, there is one river in karnataka uh, from which uh, one canal is there i forgot the name and that water is rich in potassium 
very significant quantities of potassium are available in some waters. Do you know in Kerala soil, uh, potassium levels are very high. Uh, how much levels are, what are the levels of potassium in general in soils? Anybody can tell? Available potassium, how much available potassium will be there in soils? If you know the classification of soils, uh, classification of nutrients available in soil, uh, like uh, potassium, it is 110 to 280 kg potassium per hectare. If it is less than 110, uh, your available potassium, your soil is low in potassium. If it, is, if it is 110 to 280, then it is medium in K availability. If it is more than 280, then it is rich in potassium or high in potassium. So that means the soils which are rich in potassium can contain potassium at least 280 kilograms per hectare. But do you know that certain soils in Kerala contain 5,000 kilo, 5, kilograms of potassium? So, so sometimes uh, the water, water is rich in uh, potassium and if you irrigate with this kind of water, then your soil will become rich in potassium. And also the soil which was derived from minerals, they, they were also rich in potassium. So um, irrigation water sometimes also supplies nutrients. Atmospheric deposition, they should be counted. And there can be some output or some losses. Losses by crop harvest, soil erosion, leaching runoff and gaseous losses and weeds also take up nutrients. So you need to uh, at least add uh, what has been removed from the soil. At least that much quantity should be added. Now you see different sources, on-farm sources, crop rotations, if you have legumes in the rotation. Farmyard manure can be produced on the farm. Green manure, crop residue, poultry manure, sheep and goat manure, Biogas slurry and sludge, sludge after treatment, vermicompost, these are on farm sources and certain off farm sources are also there. Coir pit, press mud, you know press mud, anybody knows about press mud and bagas. Press mud and bagas. Yeah. Sir, byproduct of sugar can, sir. Very good. And bagas. Sir, Sekha, uh, G A double S E I think bagas. Sir, after removal of juice, the byproduct, the traces, that is. Uh... That is placement film. And molasses is also there. So there are many sugar industry byproducts. So bagas is actually the cane. When you crush the cane and take out the juice, the remaining organic matter, remaining biomass is your bagas. B A G A double -S, S E. That is your bagas. That can act as a fuel uh, because some uh, local people, local farmer, they want to make good. Locally, they want to make good or some other product. So what they can do, they can when they prepare the good, they need to evaporate the the juice to remove water. So they need some fuel. So this bagas can be used as a fuel material. It can be used in paper industry. It can be used uh, making gatta, you know, gatta. Uh, I don't know what it is called in English. Gatta, you understand gatta? Any word, English word for gatta? You know gatta? This is, <laughs> this is, this is gatta, you know, this, you can see it. Art. So this can be made from bagas. And press mud is what you said, uh, that when you clean the juice, and then there are some, uh, some items accumulated, some waste material accumulated, and you can take it out, and it, it is accumulated in large amounts. And sometimes it, it, it is rich in uh, calcium, and sometimes it is rich in sulfur, depending upon the process used for sugar making. So this press mud 
contains some nitrogen also, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, or calcium. So, press mud can be used, oil kits can be used, but they find restricted use because they are from off the farm. Uh, Biocompost, sewage and municipal waste, minerals, blood meal, fish meal, biofertilizer. Of course, biofertilizer are off farm resources, but they can be used, with, uh, their use is permitted. Traditional preparations and fly ash. So, these are important sources, and you need to combine combination and optimal combination will give you the best results. And then average nutrient content of oil cakes. Oil cakes are good source of nutrients and they have very CN, uh, narrow CN ratio compared to CN ratio of other organic manuals. So you can see castor cake contain 5.8% nitrogen and 1.8 to 1.9% P2O5 and 1 to 1.1% K2. Similarly, you can see neem cake, karanj cake, mahua cake, all these are non-edible oil cakes. So non-edible oil cakes can be used in organic farming and they are cheaper also compared to, uh, uh, compared to edible oil cakes. Ajao, compared to edible oil cakes. And you can see the next slide. Just a minute. Uh, you can see the average nutrient content. So you can remember this average nutrient content. You need not to remember. So you can see the average nutrient content in different oil, oil, this oil seed cakes. So nitrogen is 4.9 to 5%. So roughly you can remember at least 5% that oil seed cakes normally contain 5% nitrogen, 1.7% P2O5 and 1.5% or you can say 1.8% P2O5 and 1.5% K2. So you can remember average content of nutrients in them. So they have very narrow CN ratio and they are quick acting. So they can be applied um, along with other organic values. Now, constraint of nutrient management in organic systems. So you have seen the sources and you need to apply their combination. Limitation of organic manures, large amount is required. There's no doubt about it that we are short of organic manures the quantity of organic manures required is very large. And also the handling of large quantity of these manures is difficult. You need to transport bulky organic manures and uh, it is also a limitation. If it is urea, one bag urea or SSP fertilizer, they are very rich in nutrients. So their transport cost is low. But if you want to transport organic manures, their cost is high and their application rate is also high. In case of fertilizer, because they are rich in nutrients, their application rate is low. So compared to fertilizers, they are required in large am amount and money required to transport, handle, use them is also more. Slow release of nutrients, another problem. There may be demand of nutrient at one particular growth stage and, and it may not be able to meet out the whole demand, particularly in winter months. And also these organic manures like farmyard manure loses nutrients. When you handle it in the house or cattle, cattle shed, when you store it or when you make it mature or prepare it, then also, and when you apply in the field, at all the stages of farmyard manure, you will find losses through leaching and volatilization. Difficulties in adoption of diversified rotations. Sometimes rotations also supply you nutrients by having legumes in the rotation or as intercrop, then there may be difficulty in rotations. Problem of including legumes in rotations. Matching the nutrient requirement with demand, it is difficult. Quantity of nutrient sources to be used. We don't know. Farmers, for local condition, you need to give recommendation if for variable sources. Some farmer is interested to use rock phosphate or, or mineral sulfur and so on and so on. 
So a lot of research is really required to be done in nutrient management. Now you see constant continuous nutrient combinations are not known. Sometimes immature manure can be there, compost or farmyard manure. For your information, I want to tell you that organic farming was blamed to kill 300 people in Germany. In year 2011, uh, about 300 people died by consuming organic cucumber. You, you would be shocked to know it. Then the organic farming was blamed. So main uh, problem or main reason was that they have used some manure, organic manure, which was not matured and it contained salmonella bacteria. And then those salmonella bacteria entered the, or, or it entered the, um, infected the cucumber, cucumber and they were carried, and you know cucumber are eaten raw. And then these people were infected with salmonella. Then organic farming was blamed. So these compost or farmyard manure, whenever we use, we should, get them complete, completely composted, get them complete, completely mature, then we should apply. Secondly, these manures, if they are used immature, besides spreading the human uh, health issues, uh, means, uh, um, uh, you, you know, there are certain health issues related to immature compost or FYM. They can carry some uh, infecting organisms. Similarly, they can encourage the infestation of termite in the field if you use immature manures. Uh, next is biofertilizers effectiveness and response. It is easy to say that use rhizobium, use biofertilizer, use azospilum, use mycorrhiza. Many times, by the time you use it, they are already died they have already became uh, ineffective. So how to know that the biofertilizer that I am using or that a farmer is using is effective? If it is dead, then it will not do any function there in the soil. So uh, the response uh, effectiveness of biofertilizer is not guaranteed. And also the response, response of biofertilizer is not continuous. In some years, you can get response in other year, you may not get response. The main reason is that um, they are not effectively inoculated or they are not effective themselves. They have died, they are not working. Contribution of legumes and green manures. Normally it is difficult to work out that how much has been contributed by legume and green manure. Then cost, sometimes they are very costly. For example, vermicompost, it is sold at, at, at the rate of, say, about uh, 10 to 15 rupees a kg. So it is expensive. Non-scientific thinking, like ZBNF. So just a few days back, uh, I was surprised to know, now they have changed the name again. Last time I told you that it was initially zero budget natural farming, then low cost natural farming, and now it is simply Subhas, Subhas Palekar farming. Now natural word has been deleted. You would surprise. Now they have deleted the natural word. So slowly means it will go up. It will vanish from the scene. Now summary of nutrient management. You need not to go. You can go through this slide. Now you see uh, nutrient management. The main thing is that now recommendation have come come up for system basis that you apply this, you apply that. But the best thing is that we should have diversified sources of nutrient. Some should be supplied by legumes following crop rotation, some by green manure, some by adding crop residues, some by FIM, some by green manuring through XC2. XC2 green manuring is also possible. So a lot of options are there. Biofertilizer can be used, press mud can be used, so variety of combination and resources or sources should be used so that we can reduce the cost of production. If you want to supply all nutrients through farmyard manure only, then it will be very expensive. The cost or price of one kg nitrogen, if you supply through FIN, 
will be more than 200 rupees. You need about 200 to 250 rupees to supply one kg nitrogen through farmyard manure. But if you want to supply one kg nitrogen through urea, it is costing rupees 11.25 paise, or say 12 rupees, not more than that. So that is the difference. So uh, one farmer cannot completely rely on farmyard manure or compost. He or she has to use variety of sources to supplement the nutrients. Now see tools or component of organic pest management. This is for insect pest management. And you may consider the same thing for disease management also. So you can see variety of options are available. Like uh, you can see uh, ecology of pests should be known. These methods have been taught to you in your BSc AG. I'm not going to teach you in detail. Just I am showing you that there are a lot of options to manage insect pests and disease in organic farming also. Here you can't see chemical control. You can't see insecticide or fungicide here. So these approaches like ecology of pests, pest surveillance and monitoring, ETL, host plant resistance, behavioral methods, pheromones, legal methods, any entomology book will give you knowledge on this IPM. Physical methods, mechanical methods, cultural methods, biological methods like botanicals, predators, parasitoids, pathogens, virus, fungi, bacteria. A lot of options are available these days. Of, of course, uh, some biological methods uh, uh, are there which are effective uh, for insect control, particularly viruses. Now, overall, you can see tools and practices for insect pest management. You can include, consider disease also. Manipulation of crop rotations. Number one option is to go for crop rotations to minimize survival of crop specific pests. For example, you understand if you take uh, crops of the same family year after a year or in the rotation, then the same, uh, same insect will continue to survive round the year. But if you break the cycle, if you bring different crops all together, a different crop in the rotation, then the, the insect which was there in the preceding crop will die. And it will not, it may not come next year. So these kind of strategies are important. For example, in case of rice weed system, there is one insect pest, which is a pink stem borer. Have you heard of this insect? Pink stem borer. Anybody heard of this? Pink stem borer. I tell you, this is very common in Pakistani Punjab, Indian Punjab, Haryana now. This infects the wheat. In wheat, say 20 years before, you would never know stem borer. Stem borer was not a pest or insect pest of wheat. But when people started conservation and culture in these areas, the new insect has come, which is your pink stem borer. The, the caterpillar of this insect is pink in color. Pink in color, therefore it is called pink stem borer. So it affects both rice and wheat. So if you grow rice and wheat in sequence, then you can have the same insect which was there in rice can infect the wheat and vice versa. If it was in wheat, it can infect the rice. So if you change the crop rotation altogether here, if you for one year, don't take rice and wheat, take maize or take some other crop. Uh, you can take pigeon pea, pigeon pea in, suppose just I'm telling you, and and then mustard can be taken. So if you change the rotation, you can change the insects. A strict cropping similarly manages the insect pests. If you have, say, four or five line of one crop, four or five line of another crop, the insect which is there in one strip cannot move to the next strip because in between the another crop strip will act as a barrier for the insect. So a strict cropping is also good for uh, controlling the insect pests. And it will also give you benefits of diversification of cropping system. Manipulation of pH level or moisture level. This is also important because many times you know certain diseases are favored by a particular pH. So if you make alterations in the pH, you can reduce the incidence of diseases. As you might be knowing that acidic pH encourages more of fungi and basic pH, alkaline pH encourages more of bacteria. 
So you can manipulate depending upon the whether it is bacterial disease or fungal disease. Some manipulation is possible through pH. Manipulation of planting dates. I think you are aware of these kind of techniques. That, for example, white fly incidence. If you go for early sorghum sowing, you will have more incidence of white fly in sorghum. But if you delay the sorghum planting or sowing, you can avoid this insect. So there are many alterations uh, in uh, alteration that can be made in sowing time so that the insect infestation will be reduced. Adjustment of seeding rate. Similarly, some insects um, were found when your plant population was more, and some insects were found when your plant population was less. But there has to be some optimum plant population. We mostly done this research uh, from the perspective of higher yields, but we have never done this research for uh, control of insect pests and diseases. So, of course, there is lack of information on this subject. Use of suitable plant varieties and livestock. You can get insect pests and disease tolerant and resistant varieties. Biological control methods should be used. Trapping insects or trap uh, insect traps can be used. Sanitation is the best. You should clean your buns. There should not be any weeds in the field. Remove them because weeds act as a host, alternative host for insect pest diseases. So clean, cleaning of the field is necessary. And there are so many methods, physical methods of insect pest management. And at last, some botanicals can be used like rotinone, neem, pyrethrum, biologicals like bacillus thuringiensis can be used to control some insects, uh, insect or disease, I think. Bacillus thuringiensis is used to control disease or insect. Any Sorry. idea? Insect. Okay. So. And pheromones and minnas, certain minnas can be used to control insects. So you have a lot of options for insect pest and disease management. And one more option is there, which is which is called as ecological engineering. There is one more new concept for controlling the insect pest and diseases in crops, which is known as ecological engineering. Ecological engineering means you can learn from the nature, learn from the nature and apply those principles in the agro ecosystem or artificial ecosystems. So if you remember that uh, human beings made aeroplane, aeroplane by seeing the birds, once you are seeing the birds, the birds are flying, it is having wings, and you see the shape, the shape of the bird. In the, the first most thing is the beak. The beak is there, and now you see any aeroplane. The shape of the beak is there. In most fighter planes, you will say, see that they are just like bird's nose, you know? And, and in the end, you got the tail, tail of the bird, and you, you see the wings. So it is almost copied. The bird's structure or physical structure was copied by human beings to make the aeroplane. So similarly, there are many natural cycles, natural things which are happening in the nature. We can imitate them. We can copy them in our agro ecosystem. So this is job of entomologists to find. So in this direction, this is very, very important. <laughs> uh, ecological engineering. So here you can see that uh, this is known as push and pull theory for stem borer and stiger control. So what can be done here? You can see maize. Maize is there. Maize, sorghum, and parmelate, bajra. These three crops are affected by one insect, which is stem borer. So stem borer can affect. The larvae of the insect can enter the stem and it eats from inside and then plant will dry. So this is uh, damaged by stem borer in Bajra, Jwar, and Makkah, your maize. So what can be done? The maize, maize or sorghum or Bajra can be intercorp, intercorp with desmodium. Desmodium can be intercorp between two rows of uh, maize or sorghum or Bajra. So this is desmodium. Desmodium is a leguminous plant. It is used for fodder purpose. 
in certain East Asian countries and African countries, it is used as a fodder plant, leguminous fodder. So, and one stem borer is there on the boundary, napier grasses, napier grasses planted. Napier grass is planted on the boundary. One row of napier grass. Napier grass is your Penicetum purpurea. So this maize plant or bajra plant or sorghum plant also have one semi-root parasite, which is known as Stryga. Stryga is a semi-root parasite, which also affects the maize or sorghum or palmillate. So, but if we plant Desmodium as inter intercrop and Napier grass on the boundaries, then we can solve this problem. Means the stem borer can be controlled and the striga can also be controlled. Now you can see how it can be controlled. This desmodium, when it starts growing, it will release certain volatile compounds into the environment. And it will release certain volatile compounds into the environment. And there may be adult male and female of stem borer. You know, there are four cycles of Lepidopterous insect. This is Lepidopterous insect. So it will, adult will lay down the eggs. Eggs will hatch into pupae, oh sorry, larvae or caterpillar. And then this caterpillar or larvae uh, will be converted into pupa and pupa to adult. So this adult will be pushed away. It cannot bear the smell of this volatile compound. It will push it, push it away from the maize plant. And you need some more thing to attract it. <clears throat> then this adult male and female will be attracted by napier grass. Napier grass on the boundary. It will attract this adult. It will pull them. This is known as pulling. And pushing is this desmodium has pushed the adult away from the maize plant. And this napier grass is pulling, pulling the adult plant uh, because it is also releasing some volatile compounds into the air. And that get, uh, by smelling that, these insects get attracted towards the grass. Now, female will lay down the eggs here. Eggs will be laid down here. And the volatile compounds which are there in the napier grass, they will kill the eggs. They will kill the eggs. So you can see eggs are killed. If eggs are killed, then you will not get pupa. You will not get pupa. And then the stem borer will not be there in maize. Uh, sorghum or uh, palmillate. And now it is turn of the Stryga. So Stryga grows on the roots, you know, it is semi-parasite, semi-root parasite. It takes mineral and water from the maize plant. The roots of this plant intermingle with the roots of maize, sorghum or bajra plant and they extract the nutrients and water from the plant. And they also got some green leaves so they can do their own photosynthesis. So they are semi-root parasite. And what will happen? This desmodium will release the um, will release the volatile compounds or exudates into the soil that will kill the propagating parts of the uh, stride. So therefore, this desmodium and napier they control the this particular disease. So you can see the, the role of diversification. This is an, a classical example of diversification. If you are having three different plants, three different plants, then they could control one insect. It is also possible they can control, control two or three insects. If you change the combination, many times we may, not, we may not know it, but nature is doing it. In nature, in natural forest area, there may be thousand kind of such cycles which are happening, but we don't know. There may be many useful or helpful or friendly insects there that are doing this job without making it known to us. So that is your ecological engineering. So if you want to read more, and this is your homework also, you can type in your Google, push and pull for a stem border. So you will get thousands of pages or information on this subject. You can enrich your knowledge. This is push. And similarly, weed management. I'm not going into much details of weed management. So, uh, <clears throat> but I will just expose you to this. Weed management in organic crops. 
we already know that if you use herbicide, then there are a lot of problems associated with herbicide. I have shown you some herbicides uh, can leave their residue in the soil that can disturb the soil microbiology and they can become also become part of our, our food. The, the plants can, uh, the crop plants can also absorb some quantity of herbicide that can be cycled to the food. And residues in the environment, your earthworm will be killed. Pollinating insect, it can be harmful to pollinating insect. Aquatic animals, sometimes aquatic herbicides are also used. Resistant to weeds, there are a lot of problems associated with herbicide use. So there are some eco-friendly management of uh, insect pests and diseases. Sorry, weeds, I'm talking about weeds now. So options like zero tillage, farms, region follow, these are cultural approaches for weed management, some preventive approaches, clean crop seeds, sowing adjustment. So a lot of options are available for weed management. So they can be done, like preventive strategies, certify crop seeds, clean machinery, cut the infested weeds, cleaning. So I'm not teaching you weed management. Physical methods are available, hand weeding, moving, grazing, mulching, tillage, cultural practices like crop rotations, uh, because you are not a student of agronomy, I think. So I can explain you some aspects, how these things can control the weeds. Crop rotations, for example, how crop rotations can control the weeds. So actually there are some uh, many factors by which crop rotations can control the weed. One is that they may release some uh, root exudates. Certain crops release root exudates and they can control certain weeds. I give you one example uh, of uh, uh, rice wheat rotation. You go to rice wheat rotation and in rice wheat rotation, if you grow the wheat, a failless minor is very, very common. Failless minor is very, very common. But in place of wheat, if you, if you grow the Barsin crop, there will not be single plant of failless minor in Barsin crop. So by rotating the crop, by changing the crop, this wheat crop with uh, Barsin, you have reduced the incidence of failless minor. So there are many examples, classical examples, where crop rotations help in controlling the weeds. Plant competition, you can, uh, there are several strategies. You can take the varieties whose speed of germination, whose early establishment is very fast, and they are able to compete with the uh, plants. Now people are doing some research. Some crop establishment methods are there, like zero tillage, it has been found that it reduces weed incidence. Prepare good seed weight, but the stale seed weight technique, rate of seeding, crop variety, smoother crop. So some cultural practices are there, and these can be applicable in organic farming. <clears throat> Bed planting, Dr. T.K. Das is working on weeds, and he has uh, shown uh, some data on this, and he says that if you grow crops on the raised bed, weed uh, management of wheat incidence or is less, conserve resources and so on. So you can see these kind of practices, mulching. You can see mulching under conservation and culture. So if we do the same thing in organic farming, we can do it. Uh, we can go for uh, conventional tillage, no need to go for zero tillage. You plant your crop and then, then one can spread the mulch. So mulch will conserve the water and it will also uh, uh, is so or reduce the weed infestation. So zero tillage example is there, not much detail. You can go through these two slides. So you see mulching. Mulching is really good in winter crops. One can go for mulching, this kind of scene. So this was directly sown, I think, under zero till condition. I borrowed this, the, all these pictures from Dr. T.K. Das. You see mulching in water hyacinth, mulching potato can be practiced. So water hyacinth, you know, it can be used as a mulch also. And in the end, it will decompose and supply nutrients. So 
also some allelopathic effects can be employed. You need not to go into that much detail. Uh, and these are biogens for parthenium weeds. So we are not growing parthenium in organic. This parthenium control is there under non-cultivated areas where cultivation is not there. So these are classical examples and they never find their use in field conditions. So in the end, I conclude now, uh, technology packages for different crops, soils and climates are evolving. Means what should be the right nutrient management practices? What should be the crops, crop rotations? It is still evolving. We do not have very solid recommendations like we have for conventional farming. Even in some countries, for your information, I want to tell, as early as in 2005, in European Union, they have started a breeding program, breeding varieties for organic farming, specifically suitable for organic farming. People have started breeding those varieties. And take example of conservation agriculture in India. Now some breeders are, breeding wheat varieties right at IR, which are suitable for conservation agriculture. So now we have HD3226, I think something name, some name is there, I, I will confirm you, but you can also browse Google to find out varieties which are specifically recommended for conservation agriculture. Similarly, we should have varieties which are specifically recommended for organic farming, in major crop, at least in the beginning, we can develop growth. Breeders, breeders are not coming forward for organic farm. They, they have come forward for conservation agriculture, but now there is need to come for organic farming also because area under organic farming in India is more than the conventional farm. You can check under conventional for organic farming, you have 2.66 million hectare cultivated area. And we do not have any data, any official data from government of India under conservation agriculture. All these data is coming from outside. Nutrient, weed, insect pests, and disease management are the important issues. They are really limitations. Nutrient management is also a limitation. That is why I told you in winter crops in Northern India, the productivity is still low. So nutrient management is really difficult. If we go for oil cakes application under uh, winter season or rubby season, then it will become very expensive job. If we want to supply say half of the nutrient requirement through oil seeds, oil seed cakes, then it will be very expensive. If we want to supply nutrient requirement through vermi compost for rice or wheat for these crops, then it will be expensive. So vermi compost is, is normally recommended for ported crops where you grow crops in ports or small areas or nurseries or high value crops or somewhere in plastic uh, houses, these poly houses, there this vermi compost can be used. But for field crops, it becomes very, very expensive, this vermi compost. So, um, uh, and then, uh, crop rotations or diversifications are very, very important if you want to succeed in organic farming. And similarly, uh, these rotations are helpful in managing insect pests and diseases and need to develop cultivation packages for different crops under varying soil and climatic conditions. So now it ends the lecture here and uh, I stop sharing this and I also stop the recording.